Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we'll be exploring the supernatural. With me is Richard Smoley, who is the author of the book, The Supernatural Writings on an Unknown History. Richard is also the editor of Quest, the Journal of the Theosophical Society in America, and he is the past editor of Gnosis Magazine. In addition, he is the author of many books, including How God Became God, What Scholars Are Really Saying About God and the Bible and Inner Christianity, the Guide to the Esoteric Tradition, and Hidden Wisdom, the Guide to the Western Esoteric Traditions. Welcome, Richard. Thank you. It's good to be here. It's a pleasure to be with you. Let's start by defining what you mean by supernatural. Well, there's what we think of as the natural, mm -hmm. which is what obeys, we think, the laws of physics, the laws of biology as known. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there are things that do not fit into this uh, in any sort of way. Uh, sometimes these experiences uh, are widespread. They're seen by many people. Sometimes they're very, very uh, localized. They're only seen by one person, which is more likely the case, mm -hmm. and they don't fit into the laws of nature, so they are bracketed as supernatural. Um, now, in this day and age, the supernatural is by and large equated with the illusory or imaginary or false mm -hmm. or hoaxed, mm -hmm. but most humanity over most of the course of human history has not seen it that way. Mm -hmm. How do you see it? I see it as the operation of laws and forces that current knowledge does not want to acknowledge or see mm -hmm. uh, or integrate into its worldview because they believe that um, be accepting these things uh, would force them to jettison all the other things they think they know about even the natural world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, as the editor of Quest, the Journal of the Theosophical Society in America, there's a wonderful case study about the supernatural, and you deal with this in, in your book, The Idea of Hidden Masters, mm -hmm. which is uh, an important part of the history of the Theosophical Society, and not just the Theosophical Society, but the Society for Psychical Research in England, a supposedly objective group of scholars who investigated Madame Blavatsky and her claim of mysterious letters materializing in the ceiling from hidden masters. And uh, they wrote a huge report back in the 19th century debunking her claim, and then a hundred years later had to apologize. Mm -hmm. Well, whenever you investigate something like this, you go in, like it or not, heavily armed with your preconceptions. Mm -hmm. And uh, in a sense, very likely you've written this report in your head before you've uh, started the research. Well, This is not the way you're supposed to do it, but it is what happens. It's, it's usually what happens. And I think one of the reasons is because in modern culture, anyone who comes out and says, we've investigated and we conclude the supernatural is real, they know they're going to be bombarded with hostile criticism. Yes. And as you know much better than I, uh, the world of parapsychology is haunted and vexed by this. Mm -hmm. uh, it, you know, it is very hard. Oh, I, I don't even feel comfortable saying this because you know it so much better than I do, but, you know, to do some research of this kind and tr try to take it seriously uh, is, you know, you have to just uh, assume you're going to be made a laughing stock. Uh, and so it takes a lot of courage uh, to investigate this stuff in a, in a very uh, scientific manner. Well, let's talk about uh, what we know about hidden masters. All right. Well, what we know is very little and very elusive. Now, let us take some of the 
great spiritual figures of the 20th century. You already mentioned H.P. Blavatsky, who was founder of the Theosophical Society. Some of the others are Rudolf Steiner, the Austrian esotericist. There's G.I. Gurdjieff, uh, the great, uh, actually he was Greco-Armenian mm-hmm. master. Mm-hmm. Uh, I tend to think of him as Russian, but Greco-Armenian is... That, it's correct, I believe. Uh-huh. I believe yeah. that's correct. René Guénon was a very powerful French uh, philosopher, mm-hmm. uh, and even C.G. Jung. Now, what's interesting about all of these figures, if you look at them biographically, every single one of them, there is no real indication of who their teachers were. Mm. Gurdjieff went off and studied somewhere in Central Asia, we think, and plus other places. Uh, he studied with people. He wrote about it. Not, It is not agreed what Gurdjieff himself wrote about it, what parts were, shall we say, fictional, allegorical, which parts weren't. Mm-hmm. But at one point, and he was not by nature a humble man, at one point he said to his pupils, you know, I am small man compared to those who sent me. Mm-hmm. But we know nothing about them. Mm-hmm. Rudolf Steiner, uh, when he was in his early adulthood, I believe, came across some old uh, German or Austrian herb gatherer Mm. who introduced him to a master about whom I don't think anything is known, including his name. Mm. Uh, Jung was taught by this and this is another aspect of it, of being on the inner planes that he called Philemon. Mm -hmm. René Guénon, uh, who was in the, the occult world of France in the um, first decade of the 20th century. A lot of his writing, you know, is based on Hindu thought, but what his connections were to Hindu thought and the Vedanta are unknown. Mm-hmm. Um, so, with all, and so, all of these figures, um, we don't really know who taught them. And these are, these are the big names. Behind the big names are figures who definitely, definitely do not want to be in the foreground. Mm-hmm. Why? Well, of course, well, if you're an illumined master, what do you want? You want you, do you want to be bothered by the press? Um, yeah, I mean, you can see what would be written about you. There'd be all sorts of things debunking you. I mean, who would want to be crazy enough to, uh, you know, get involved with something like that? Uh, I myself believe that there are such figures, mm-hmm. uh, that the better they are, the less publicity they want, mm-hmm. and generally enjoin uh, anyone who makes contact with them to uh, basically a certain amount of s- secrecy, mm-hmm. um, and that this has gone for a long, long time. Uh, go back to another, there, there was a figure, um, the old man in the mountain, who was uh, a mystical a Christian teacher of the 14th century, I believe. So this goes back a long, long way. Uh, And the idea that these figures exist, um, you know, and and up to a certain point, you don't have to believe in any supernatural things whatsoever to imagine that there are hidden teachers who uh, stay out of the limelight. And and they communicate to select disciples or pupils Mm -hmm. via esoteric means, including appearing in dreams or telepathy or even materialization or, in the case of Madame Blavatsky, letters that Mm -hmm. uh, materialize, supposedly. And incidentally, those letters are currently in the collection of the British Museum. Yes, you can still go and I assume you have some real business looking at them. You can go and look at them to this day. I guess I would say, just uh, as a caveat, that just to assume that there are these hidden masters doesn't necessarily force you to assume that they're communicating in all sorts of paranormal ways. Mm. Uh, You know, in her case, she uh, did uh, make such claims. Um, I myself am uh, open-minded about, you know, all of these uh, supposedly materialized Precipitated is, is the word that's used in theosophical circles. These mm-hmm. letters were precipitated in a sort of quasi-photographic mystic process. Yes. Uh, I am agnostic about, you know, are they really supernatural? They, you know, what, uh, as any stage magician will tell you, you can fake just about anything. Right. So I, I, I have no personal commitment to, like, these things were real and they are real occult things. Mm-hmm. I am fairly convinced that these figures that she talked about were actual human beings uh, on the physical earth, as they said they were, 
uh, and that she was being taught by them in some kind of way or another mm -hmm. about the paranormal stuff. Um, you know, it's a, it's a long, long time ago. All these people are dead, and um, you know, hanging your you know your belief system on you know something that may or not have been the case is not a wise thing to do. Well, even though the uh, these events reported by the Theosophical Society occurred in the early twentieth, late nineteenth centuries, uh, they seem to be consistent with philosophical spiritual traditions, both Eastern and Western, that go back thousands of years. Yes, and I think just about all uh, traditions have some version of this, and there are teachers on inner planes. Mm -hmm. In the 16th century, there was a Jewish Kabbalist named Joseph Caro, who had all his teachings, he said, uh, from an inner teacher, or Magid, which is simply Hebrew for teacher, uh, that transmuted it this way. More recently, you have channeled material, mm -hmm. and channeled material, as you know, is of widely varying quality. Mm -hmm. Most of it is, frankly, pretty banal. Yes. But there are a couple of ones that stand out. One is the Seth material of Jane Roberts. The other, in my view, is A Course in Miracles, mm -hmm. which is uh, translated, a, a transmitted, mm -hmm. uh, allegedly by Jesus Christ himself mm -hmm. to a woman, who, a New York psychologist who was basically an atheist. And remained an atheist even after transmitting all of this material. Yeah. Helen Shuckman, a, a woman I m knew. Did you? Yes, oh, indeed. Well, one thing that I was told about her recently, you know, she was planning her memorial service uh, shortly before she died, mm -hmm. and she told her you know, loved ones, um, don't mention the chorus during the service because all my friends are going to be there. <laughs> so not only did she, was she not like this, you know, crazed self-promoter, she was very, very discreet and even reluctant to associate herself with it. So you have to, uh, you know, take self-promotion or, you know, or grandiosity out of the picture in that case. Mm -hmm. And what you have is a profound statement of mystical Christianity, uh, although it would take a long time to say what the Course is really about. I would say it's not only the greatest spiritual text of the 20th century, but it is the only Christian theology that I've ever seen of any kind anywhere that is not, um, to some degree or another, just self-contradictory. Mm. Uh, it follows from its premises in a logical way, whereas all the others, um, you know, uh, eventually end up taking refuge in mystery. Oh, well, well, it's a mystery. Well, you can you can hide behind. There is a genuine thing as mysteries, yeah. but what you there are also such things as logical paradoxes and you know logical corners that you paint yourself into. And um, you know, although you're willing to evoke mystery and that kind of thing, you know, on your own behalf, uh, people who do that are rarely willing to grant mm -hmm. the same favor to uh, people who disagree. Yeah. Well, it strikes me that when we're talking about the supernatural here, there are two elements. One is the, the philosophical element that uh, can, can we hold a world view in, in which there are mysteries things that, that will forever remain beyond the understanding of uh, rational logic and science. And then the other element of it is, is the applied, the practitioner element. Can we invoke spirits? Are we able to, through various rituals and practices, uh, get in touch with these powers and manifest miracles in our mm -hmm. lives? Mm -hmm. And um, one could take that in a lot of different directions. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot. There are a lot of people who have uh, dipped their toes into this water. Yes. I mean, the, the classic, you know, kind of cliche example is the bunch of girls who get a Ouija board together, and you know, uh, half the time, you know, oh my God, this works. Mm -hmm. Or, I mean, there, you know, there, there are these books on you know, teen Wicca and teen witchcraft. You know, this girl, you know, reads this book and makes some kind of spell, and you know. Uh, oh my God, it works. And mm -hmm. the same sensible response is to get scared and just let it drop, which is what most people do. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, then there are some people who say, wow, this is neat. And, <laughs> you know, those are the ones who get into trouble. There mm -hmm. are a small number, the smallest of all, who say, well, there's something here. I don't necessarily want to use it to, uh, you know, win the lottery or, you know, get um, Taylor Swift as my next girlfriend, but um, there's something, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, real here and let's explore it. 
And I think those end up becoming the serious seekers. Mm -hmm. And and uh, there are many different groups that uh, have a, a combination of uh, philosophical, psychological teachings and, and various ritual practices designed to invoke supernatural powers, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In including many mainstream religions. Yes. Yes, I mean, those, uh, you know, rituals, let's say, the Christian rites of the Eucharist and so on, are, in a sense, acts of theurgy, mm -hmm. sacred magic, divine magic. Um, they're very, very ritualized and structured. So presumably one, you know, they can't be abused. Um, but a ritual that's repeated over and over again in a somewhat mindless way becomes rather mechanical. And stale. And stale. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, you could ask uh, if that hasn't happened with certain Christian sacred mysteries. Mm -hmm. um, then, of course, there are the perversions of it, the black masses and so on, where you do everything the opposite. You have a black host. You have you recite the Lord's Prayer backwards and that sort of thing. And that, you know, is meant to kind of evoke the uh, uh, nether entities. Mm -hmm. and, and some of uh, what I gather is associated with Satanism and black magic is actually a f form of social protest. Yeah. Well, Satanism as we know it today, as I understand it, got its start in the court of Louis XIV, mm. Versailles, which uh, was a pretty amoral atmosphere. Everybody cheating on everybody else, everybody, you know, backstabbing everybody else. Mm -hmm. And this priest came and he started, you know, here's the latest novelty, you know, do a black mass. And they, they got into it for a while. And finally, you know, the king drew the line and, you know, put this priest in jail and said that was that. Mm. But this whole kind of concept of the black mass kind of continued. It was its most famous description is in a book called um, La Bas over there by um, a French novelist called Isma. And this guy goes to a black mass and he describes it. And the author presumably did this. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't know exactly how it turned out because in the novel, the, author, the, the narrator uh, gets disgusted by what's going on and leaves. So you can only imagine what went on after that. Mm -hmm. But this is a novel. It's a novel, but it, it apparently did... Uh, mm -hmm. to some degree reflect certain yeah. occult practices. Because there were certainly that. many, many claims about satanic rituals, uh, uh, and it's quite controversial. You have the False Memory Foundation, and yeah. you have, uh, on the other hand, the Church of Satan. Yeah. Well, the Church of Satan is interesting. It was founded by a former carnival barker named, barker named Anton Zendor LaVey. Yes. And uh, he... Um, he cobbled together his satanic Bible from a number of sources. Mm -hmm. And one of the most uh, important uh, academic scholars of Satanism, an Italian named Massimo Introvigne, says that the chief ideological influence on Mr. LaVey was none other than Ayn Rand. Mm. Because what he's talking about in the satanic Bible of his is, you know, the triumph of individual will. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody else be damned. You know, it's about me. Um, I, I hell with all of these codes that you know tell me to be a nice person and you know turn the other cheek. I'm not going to yeah. do that because that's just bull. Mm -hmm. So weirdly, you know, Ayn Rand, the darling of um, you know the conservative right, yeah. turns out to have been kind of you know one of the apostles of Satanism as it manifested in the late 20th century. Well, I see the uh, correlation, but even before Ayn Rand, you had Aleister Crowley. Yes. Yeah, uh, pronouncing uh, the law of magic, do what thou wilt. Yes, and Crowley was a, an extremely uh, paradoxical figure. And the more I look into this stuff, mm -hmm. the more I tend to think of it in terms of taste. Yes. That is to say, well, what is your taste in food? Well, I don't really like spicy food. I really, like, you know, I, and so mm -hmm. on. In, in occultism and spirituality, I tend to see more and more uh, in this light. Mm -hmm. And Aleister Crowley is for people who like strong, pungent, and slightly rank flavors in their uh -huh. spirituality. Yeah, yeah. I'm, you know, I, I have to say, A, that's not for me, mm -hmm. B, it's for you all well and good. Mm -hmm. um, but he, it was definitely, you know, an, a, a, an attempt to transgress. And it is, there's a power in transgressing limits mm -hmm. because a limit 
of any kind, in a sense, contains energy. Yes. Once this limit is released or broken, the energy flows out. Well, what you're describing here sounds to me very much like Tantra, which is, must be one of the oldest traditions dealing with the supernatural. It is. And um, I've read several books on Tantra um, you know, and heard any number of things about it. I still have very little idea of what it really is. Mm -hmm. Someone once did send me a manuscript about it when I was a book editor, and uh, wow, these people knew what um, they were talking about. I may still have the manuscript. The company I was with didn't want to publish it for God knows what reason. Mm -hmm. But um, Tantra kind of just means so many things at this point that um, uh, usually it means some kind of um, arousal of the sex force to turn possibly to magical ends. And a transgression of social norms. Yes, because the it, tantric rituals, you know, involve, you know, what, five M's. They all have to say, say, begin with the letter M in Sanskrit, but, you know, three are, uh, well, wine, meat, fish, sexual intercourse. Mm -hmm. and, um, my own, I have not done any of this, and I don't really yeah. know anyone personally who's ever told me about it in any great detail. Okay. It's one of those things where I have a strong sense that if uh, I had any experience with it or, or really mm -hmm. knew much more about it, my ideas about it would be very, very different. Mm -hmm. Conceptually, I'm willing to say, yeah, this is all part of that whole, uh, you know, milieu. And, um, you know, when you, you transgress boundaries, you release energy, and you don't necessarily know what... Um, these energies are going to do. There is a funny story about Aleister Crowley who decided um, that he was going to uh, in, um, invoke some uh, rather powerful entities, um, some kind of ritual involving the watchtowers, which I think he did in 1909 or 1910. And he claimed it was successful, uh, you know, and that this, all this energy was uh, released. Um, I think he kind of liked to believe that this, these energies um, somehow brought about the First World War, hmm. uh, which, although, like, what if 30 million people were killed? <laughs> That's so what? Yeah. I'm, I'm, that means I'm a really powerful magus. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, there's a certain amorality to it because you want to kind of see what you can do. Um, inevitably, you get your fingers mm -hmm. burned. Well, you use the term magus, and th that's a term that is often associated with the uh, esoteric traditions associated with the supernatural. Mm -hmm. Well, we can talk a little bit about occult magic, mm -hmm. uh, and if we want to start somewhere to define it in some kind of way, uh, you could say it is the raising of certain power, mm -hmm. and this power exists, and I can show you that it exists if we have time. I'm not going to do it, but I can describe it. Mm. Um, and you channel it toward a certain goal or a certain end, uh, usually by means of some kind of visualization or some ritual that corresponds to your aim. Yes. Uh, the power is easily raised, and it's um, often completely accidentally raised. The most obvious example is the high school dance where uh, all the boys are on one side, all the girls are on the other. There's an intense charge, almost electrical in feel, in the room. Mm -hmm. And one way of generating this power is put all the men on one side, put all the women on the other, and um, you know just have them uh, project energy. You mm -hmm. can just simply do this in the comfort and privacy of your own home. Mm -hmm. In this high school auditorium example, people are doing it unconsciously. Mm -hmm. You know, and then the, the ice gets broken, one couple starts to dance, and the whole, uh, the next phase of the um, chemical romance uh, starts to begin. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times this is, is present. It's present in arguments. It's present in business negotiations. You know, if one person wants something, the other person wants something else, they're sitting in the room, and they may be perfectly just civil to one another, but there's this tension and this energy, mm -hmm. uh, and it's usually experienced as uncomfortable. Yeah. And the first one who who breaks said, okay, you win. The person who wins the negotiation is the, is the person who can, in a sense, stand this energy the longest. Mm -hmm. I want to say that some people probably do this consciously. I believe a great deal uh, do it unconsciously. Yeah, I recall uh, some years ago in a uh, international chess match, uh, some of the Russian 
chess players were uh, complaining about parapsychological means being used against them? Well, the Russians have done, uh, they've looked into that. They've looked into the uh, occult uses of uh, these for things that may not be necessarily be good ends. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a Russian emigre friend who once said he met someone who had been um, trained as a psychic killer by the KGB. And my friend took it seriously. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, whether this man actually could kill someone else psychically, mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm willing to bet, uh, you know, a good mm -hmm. sized dollar that if uh, uh, the KGB tried to find out if they could do this, well, they, maybe they succeeded, maybe they didn't, but I'm sure they tried. They may have been inspired by anthropological literature on uh, death by hexing rituals. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, the thing about it is if these powers exist, they exist in all of us to some degree or another, mm -hmm. and they can be utilized to some degree or another. Now, um, you know, my impression of the parapsychological research is all of the stuff that's been done, uh, you know, all of the meta-analyses of the meta-experiments uh, um, and so on mm -hmm. have been done. And, and what it comes down to, it seems to be, is that there is very strong, well beyond statistical evidence for a force called psi, mm -hmm. PSI, in the human mind, but it is fairly weak. Mm -hmm. And if you look at this, this actually corresponds, I would say, with ordinary experience. Mm -hmm. Because these things happen, but in our lives, they're always kind of out of the corner uh, of our eyes. Yeah. They, they happen, but then they sort of, mm -hmm. they just sort of happen. Well, why, why would they not happen that way? Because we're a culture who is conditioned not to believe in it. Mm -hmm. If um, you were in a culture that, um, for some reason, believed that music did not exist, someone might play music, someone might even develop the ability or have the ability to play music, but it would certainly be, uh, musical talent would certainly be very uh, attenuated mm -hmm. in such a culture. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the case with modern Western civilization yeah. and psi abilities. Yeah. Well, Richard Smoley, what a wonderful discussion. I know we could go on for hours. This is one of my most fascinating topics. And, and I can say, just speaking personally, yes, it's a small, sometimes very, very elusive, subtle phenomenon, but in, in my case, it changed my life. And I know uh, other people uh, would say the same thing. Definitely. Thank you so much for being with me. Thank you. It's a pleasure. And thank you for being with us. Thank you.